tell me a little bit about your plans and hopes for the Music for New Media department here at UCLA. Okay, do you mean by that visual media, the f program that Music I'm in charge visual, of? Or yeah, new visual media. Visual media. Oh, God. You know, I'm, I'm a little worried about that. Oh. Not only because I'm a department of one, which is not bad because I basically answer to nobody. But my concern is that well, I have two concerns, two visions. One is a concern, and the other is a sort of advantage, I think, that we enjoy here. The concern is that I don't know whether or not we at UCLA can compete with other places that are really emphasizing film, like, for example, the program they have at USC. Notice I said at USC, since it's not a USC program, but it's housed on their campus. Uh, they have all the technology, have many people who are working in the industry mentoring young people. They also have facilities that we don't have here. I know that we at UCLA can't compete with that. What, what with our budget cuts and so forth, we are still a public institution, for example. We will never be able to compete with a private institution like that uh, that can choose its students completely on the basis of whether they can pay that huge amount of money or not. We, we can't do that, you know. That, that worries me a little bit because people are coming from all over the world. They're applying to this university and they want to come to UCLA to study visual media, a program that I run, so they can get into Hollywood, which is just over the hill here, you know. And uh, I feel a sort of burden there that I don't want to let them down. Um, but what's good is, it's very interesting. You can always see the good in, in what was considered a uh, disadvantage. We're not, we're not saddled with the huge and expensive and obsolete soundstage. The first thing I was asked by the dean when I was being uh, um, interviewed for the possibility of taking the job, they said, I suppose you want $2 million for a scoring stage. I said, no, I don't. I want my students not just to be orchestrators, but to write movies. And that means they have to have as much digital technology and experience as possible. So whatever monies we have, let's put it there. Um, and so one of the advantages of not having a flourishing scoring stage here is that we have to do things digitally. And it's therefore more likely that if you come through this program, and if you have the survivalist instinct that I hope I can instill in everybody, that they'll go out and find a filmmaker and do their own picture like I did for Roger Corman and right from the start get a feature by Drew Schnur or a feature by Jeff Cricker or something instead of being the fourth name down on the end credit as somebody who helped somebody else. Right. Most people who go to other schools like the one across town, they're working and that's a very good program therefore. But many of the people coming out of them, I would hope that they someday get their own movie. In other words, for me, the ideal of our program is that a person comes out of here and discovers that he can make a career as a composer, not as somebody's whole. Right. We'll talk about how the uh, film department plays into that. Oh, that's a good point. That's the one thing that is a blessing for me. Um, we have an excellent, at UCL, an excellent film and animation department and computer design. It's just harder to get into the film department here than it is to get into Harvard Law in terms of the number of openings and the number of applicants. It is a very good department and now the blessing is that Barbara Boyle, who's in charge of the film department, is an old colleague of mine from, believe it or not, Death Race 2000. We were both working for Roger Corman in 1974. And so we have this trust and collegiality that has brought our two departments together. The result is students here have the opportunity of working there as they never could before. But I'm also extending my uh, vision. I've been asked to teach for the last couple of years at AFI and I've discovered that they have excellent young directors who are looking for excellent young composers. So I'm hoping to make things work that way. So that in a way I don't feel so much that I'm an educator anymore as a facilitator. I want to get good people together. Mm -hmm. Great. So your advice, yes. more wisdom, <laughs> what, would be, what would be your advice for someone who comes to you and says um, Professor Trahara, I want to be a great composer. What do I have to do? Well, believe it or not, I do hear that a lot. Not stated that way. It may be disguised in such a way that even this person speaking doesn't realize that that's what he's really saying. They want to have a successful career. They want my blessings and endorsement, which is legitimate. I wanted Nadia Boulanger's, I wanted Gunther Schiller's. Nadia gave it to me and Gunther withheld it. That's their way that they respectively taught, you know. But they both helped me and nurtured me into becoming whatever I am. Um, I think I, I haven't really a clue on how to become a great composer. I think you have to have talent and I have nothing whatever in distributing that. But what I can do is perhaps encourage a person to believe in themselves and to write for things that really make them feel good. 
So for me, the, 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 you know, I don't like the word discipline. We've used that word several times in this conversation we're having. To me, discipline is something we do in the army or for a recalcitrant student at a private school or something. That's discipline. Whack, whack, you know. Here's an interesting thing. I was a student at the Hochschule in Berlin. I was a student there. And I remember asking my professor, what is the German word for discipline? Wie sagt man Disziplin auf Deutsch? He says, oh, we have a wonderful word, das Discipline. I said, that's not a German word. That's a French word. In other words, and I don't know what the word for discipline in Japanese is. Among the most disciplined people in the world, they don't necessarily use that word. <laughs> Whereas we use the word all the time here. <laughs> you know? What I'm trying to say is that's sort of my philosophy of becoming a great composer, to get back to your question. I think you encourage a person to enjoy what he's doing and to have high values and high expectation. So, for me, the model is not discipline, but the sandbox. I think, you know, every child gravitates toward the sandbox and makes up the rules. That's what a composer does. We make up our rules, and that's why we're different, and that's why discipline is not necessarily the appropriate word for becoming creative. Excellent. And last question. How would you define success? For a composer, for a musician? I know, I know how uh, many people define success. And being at a young age, I was certainly um, would have accepted this. Being a success is having other people's adulation, of being well known, that means winning prizes, and making money. I think those would have been considered among the criteria for success. None of those things are things that I'm against. And each of those things, in some measure, I've had at one time or other. But I don't feel that's the criteria for success anymore. I know that at a period when I was making a great deal of money doing shows like Sophisticated Ladies on Broadway and doing China Beach at the same time. And think about that. That's a lot of money coming in, right? I know that at that time we're among the most frantic, least serene periods of my life. I think I was tortured by ambition and 10,000 other things. But I think that I, would fe I myself would be successful if I ever could get an opera produced that I wrote. All my life I've wanted to write an opera. And when, if and when I write that, I'll be successful, whether it gets to the Met or not. That's a very personal vision of what success is. I'm not a young man anymore, and I've discovered that I didn't have to be Donald Trump in order to be happy or unhappy. Mm -hmm. So I guess success for me would be f feeling fulfilled, but that's definitely not the dictionary or the world's view of what success is. Mm -hmm. The other kind of success meaning adulation, attention, money. I've had that. Not as much as Donald Trump, but you know, certainly more than the average person in the United States. But those times are not necessarily, necessarily the times that you felt most fulfilled. Um, quite the, yes. What you said is correct. The, the, among those times, among the periods when I was most successful, was the time when I was starting to fall into habits that included all sorts of behavior that was very destructive, not just to me. The destruction that those things do is not just to you, but everybody that you touch, professionally and personally. So it sounds yeah. like you're saying that we all need to figure that out for ourselves. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. But also I have another kind of uh, thought. I think we figure it out for ourselves, but I think it's okay to have fun while you're figuring it out. Mm. And even though my career has had all kinds of ups and a great many downs, I have to tell you, I don't think I regret anything. I wouldn't do a lot of the stuff ever again. But having done them, I have to tell you, a lot of the stuff that I did, which not good, destructive, painful, while part of the road that I chose, and I, in the end, I learned from it. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Jahar. Okay, thank you. Thank you.